the things that I love and hold dear to my heart. They're just borrowed. They're not mine at all. Jesus, holy, let me use them to brighten my life. So remind me, remind me Roll back the curtains of memory now and then Show me where you brought me from Where I could have been Remember, Lord, I'm human And humans we forget So remind me, remind me Nothing good have I done to deserve God's only Son. I'm not worthy of the scars in His hands. That He chose the road to Calvary to die in my stead. Why He loved me, I just don't understand. Roll back the curtain of memories now and then Show me where you brought me from Where I should have been Remember, Lord, I'm human And humans, we forget So remind me, remind me you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 13. We welcome all of you that have been in Master Club for the last nine months. And it's been a great year. We appreciate uh, so much uh, all of you that's ran the vans every Wednesday night and uh, just worked very hard to get these children under the sound of the gospel. And it paid off because several have been saved. And that's what it's all about. I really believe that I can answer the question, and I know the Lord can answer it better than I can, that we are in the last days. And I believe that we, we're in the last of the last days. There's not a prophecy that needs to be fulfilled for the rapture to take place. And so that's why I want to go back a little bit and review Romans chapter 13, verses 10, uh, 11 through 14. And I want to preach on God's wake-up call uh, for, for a reason, is that we got anarchy in the world, we got apathy in the apostasy uh, in a lot of pulpits, and we got apathy in a lot of pews. And folks, we need to wake up because we need to realize we're in the very last days. And that's why this uh, series will be so good for you adults. Uh, and We'll have two 30-minute sessions every night uh, starting about 645. And so you'll be a part of it if you're not working in a vacation Bible school. And for all of you that are working in vacation Bible school, we'll be glad to send that DVD home with you and, and let you listen to it personally for working in Bible school. But I really believe that we're in the last days, and if we are in the last days, there's no doctrine in the Bible that should change your behavior more than believing that Jesus could come back any minute. And by the way, if you don't, you don't believe Jesus could come back any minute, you could go any minute. Uh, Brother Travis's sister is 57 years of age. Uh, Sunday night, I spent a, a, uh, uh, some time at the emergency room of a six foot eight uh, that uh, dove into a four foot pond and, about, and broke his neck. He could have been paralyzed from the neck down, and he could have been killed instantly in a snap of a, a spine, but God spared him. And I thank God the Lord did spare Andrew, and I pray that God will use this in a special way in his life. And then there's car accidents. Uh, yesterday, Connie and I had the privilege of visiting with uh, Teresa, and I said, did you remember anything? She said, no. I said, well, good, because I want to tell you something. The car looked like a... Looked like a uh, 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 something got a hold of it and crushed it. And, it, and she's, she's going home at 11 a.m. Friday morning, not a minute later. And if they do not let this young lady go, she's leaving anyway, is what she said. And I think she's determined. She's doing great. The Lord's blessed and given her life. So you never know. You're one heartbeat away from eternity. You're one aneurysm of the brain from eternity. Uh, you're, you're, you're one 
curve or one hilltop from eternity. But I believe all the signs of the time tell us that the Lord's coming very soon and we need to wake up. Let's stay in all the Word of God and I'll just read verses 11 through 14 and I'll let you out pretty early tonight. The Bible says in verse 11, and that knowing the time, that's why we're having this series next week, and I think it's going to be a good one, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation, future tense, nearer than when we believe. That's when we're going to be delivered from the presence of sin. And the night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore, let us therefore cast, I like that word, Cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, and not in strife or envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. I hope you sense the urgency of these verses, and I want to preach just a few minutes on uh, it's high time to wake up. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you uh, for this good crowd tonight, and God, thank you for the good prayer meeting, good singing, and Lord, I thank you, dear God, for every person that's made an effort to be here and be in the house of God, and I know they're tired. They've had uh, some very hot hours on the job, but God, they made it on purpose to be here, and I pray that you'd bless their hearts and encourage their soul, uh, God, as they listen to the Word of God, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice the verse. The Bible says in verse 11, it says, And that knowing the time, now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Now we just get, went through Matthew 24, which is all the signs of the time towards the second coming. Not the rapture, the second coming. But if these are signs of the time of the second coming, earthquakes, uh, famine, pestilence, that's malignant disease without a cure, now they're afraid of mosquitoes coming into uh, America uh, and, 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 and uh, killing people and, and AIDS epidemic and on and on and on. We have all the, the pestilence, a malignant disease without cure. And folks, I've never seen a day where we have as much cancer as we have now. And I'm telling you, it seems like there's about seven or eight people we know very close that have cancer and it's terminal. Miss Emily, uh, we was going to go see her, and they're calling in all the family. and We didn't want to be in the way uh, tomorrow, and I got a board meeting uh, with Macedonia, and so I'm going to go to that, but I, I tell you, my heart's down there, and my wife's heart's down there. She trained Miss Connie to be the kind of pastor's wife she is. We watched her under terrible situations uh, be such a great pastor's wife, and, and she's strong, and she's a fighter, and now they've called in hospice, and and she don't have many days left. And so, folks, the Bible says it's high time. That means the hour is here. And then the second phrase in verse 12 that I want you to notice, it says that the night is far spent. The night is far spent. As he said in the video, that a lot of people don't believe in the uh, second coming. They don't believe in the, um, uh, the Lord's coming because it's been so long. Well, that ought to tell you that. If it was close then, it's closer now. And God's been patient as he was in the flood. Methuselah lived 969 years. And the reason he did, because his name means literally, after this, the judgment. And so after Methuselah died, the judgment was coming, and God let him live 969 years. He's a patient God. And folks, true love honors the law and, and harms not our neighbors. But I want to tell you something, friend. It, uh, the conduct regarding our anticipation should be that the waking in the conduct. There's a verse 11 through 14, there's a wakening. And then there's a warring in verse 12. And then there's a walking in, in conduct. And folks, we need to realize that walk is a walk of cleanliness. So I want to just give you a real simple outline. The night is far spent. You know what that means? It's later than you think. It's later than you think. And you know, we know that uh, uh, the Lord's coming, but I want to tell you something, it's even closer than you think he is. it's coming. And I want to tell you something, I can tell you right now, lukewarm church or, or, or church of entertainment, the Lord's coming. Uh, false prophets. Uh, have, you written down, have you driven down from Walmart lately and looked to the left and seen a Mormon church? That's a false prophet place. 
I mean, that's ungodly Joseph Smith and Brigham Young that had too many wives and uh, uh, killed people and, and took people's lands. And we got, we got this Mormons uh, that are God makers. They say if they walk good enough and live good enough, they'll be their own gods. And then we got humanism all up and down the road. And then you go on down further and you, and you see on the right hand side uh, a big old tall statue about a mile up the road. And it's in the middle of the uh, front yard and they're going to remodel all those houses or tear them down and build a Buddha t- Buddhist temple. They believe in reincarnation. They believe in karma. They believe in a whole bunch of junk. And it's not Bible. Folks, it's a sign of the time. Then you drive on down and you see this big old uh, mos- mosque and is- Islam and that's a false cult. And then, folks, here we are. We need to shine in the darkness. But the only way we're going to shine is we've got to wake up. We've got to wake up. Go to slide three, Brother uh, Cody. And we need to wake up in the conduct, first of all. There ought to be a difference. Hey, listen, if you believe the Lord's coming, if you believe the Lord is coming, then it's going to change your life. True belief changes your behavior. That's why uh, the Bible always sort of divides itself in these epistles. And you'll have chapter 1, 2, and 3, usually doctrine. But then you'll have 4, 5, and 6, or whatever the end of the, uh, the book is. You'll have on uh, not only uh, believing, but behaving. Folks, we need to walk the walk because we believe the Lord's coming soon. It's later in your life than you think. James 4, 14 says that life's just a vapor. And so when we wake, wake up, we need to wake up to the fact we're not going to be here forever. Turn into your Bibles to John chapter 9, verse 4, and see our Lord's attitude when He was on this earth. John chapter 9, verse 4. If we really believe the Lord was coming, it, cha- it revolutionized everything about our life, especially our, uh, our lust and our, and our worldliness. It'd go out the back door. We would be dedicated and clean and walking for God. But uh, John 9, 4. I must work the works of Him that sent me. Jesus speaking now. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. And folks, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And folks, as long as you're in the world, there's a light in this world. But I'm afraid to say a lot of people are asleep. You know, all soul winning that you're ever going to do will be done on this earth. Luke chapter 16 the uh, rich man uh, in hell pleaded to go back and talk to his five brothers. And he said, no, uh, you had your chance in your lifetime. And folks, but now there's a guff that's fixed. So eternity is forever and there's no purgatory and there's no paying your way out. Folks, we need to realize it's a time to wake up. Too many sermons are like bedtime stories instead of reveries, instead of the charge, the trumpet. How can we sit comfortably in a pew when civilization around us is crumbling and going to hell? There was once an um, evangelist coming back from a, um, a revival and they went past this terrible accident and they saw some people with sheets over them as they had a head-on collision and, and they were dead on the side of the road. And uh, uh, the evangelist turned around and and looked at his little son, and he was wide awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. He says, why, can, why don't you sleep? And uh, he looked at his daddy and said, Daddy, how can we sleep when men are dying? And folks, the truth is, how can we sleep, uh, spiritually speaking, put the cover over our heads in the pew, and like Samson, go asleep in the lap of a Delilah, the world, and folks, what, it, what we need to do is get up. And wake up. Let me ask you a question. What does it take for you to wake up every morning? Mountain Dew? Coffee? Caffeine? No, I'll tell you what it takes. Discipline. Straight discipline. It takes discipline not to hit the snooze button. But I'm afraid to say I believe the church has hit the snooze button. And I believe in these last days we need to wake up. And then we need to realize there's a warring in the conduct. In verse 12, the Bible says this, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. There's a work of darkness. I believe in demons. I've met some personally. 
I've seen people indwelled with demons. I've seen people impersonate, are impersonated by demons and they're actually speaking in a different voice and, and supernatural strength. And I've seen that. And I've experienced uh, that on bus visitation down in Reedsville, Georgia uh, when I was a bus captain. And uh, there were some people that were literally possessed by demons. And folks, it's real. It's a work of darkness. And so it's time to clean up. It's time to, it's time to war. That's the darkness. It's time to walk. And that's, and that's a time that you clean up your life. You clean up your life. It's high time to wake up. Go to the next uh, slide. I'm going to skip some. We need to wake up and we need to clean up. Folks, we need to wake up. We need to clean up. You know what that's saying? Folks, it's time that we not walk so close to the world that people can't identify that we're different. You take the difference out of Christianity and you take, the, you take Christ out of Christianity. All you got is an entity. And the Bible goes into detail about some things that you ought to uh, uh, clean up in your life. Uh, the next slide, cleanliness for the, for the walk. You know, you shouldn't be socializing sinfully. That's rioting, rioting. Um, that means carousing. A lot of people just carefree and they associate with people that have questionable reputation and they're just playing games. Instead of praying, they're playing. So really what they're doing is they're ungodly and they're living a life uh, that's, uh, that's uh, compromising. Then, then you can satiate, which means you can be drunk in this world. And that don't mean just drinking liquor. That means drunk with drugs and drunk with self and drunk with pride and drunk with uh, the prestige of this world and just getting high on yourself. And so, folks, it keeps, uh, you know, drunkenness, uh, uh, you know, that'll keep you out of the nightclub. That'll keep you from, uh, uh, Christians have no business uh, with the Hollywood business and the, uh, the immoral business and the chambering business. Uh, the Bible says right here, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering. That's uh, sexual sins. And folks, in the last days, there'll be a perversion. Men will be lovers of themselves. And the Bible also says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, unnatural affection. The Supreme Court just okayed men to marry men in the United States of America. And women... To marry women, I was trying to think of a better terminology than a woman, but I'll describe that. And that's, that's, that's sickening, that's perverted. I never thought I'd live in a day where America would be that perverted. What we need to be is converted. And we need to be angels, uh, 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 messengers of light in this dark world. But folks, judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. And folks, even the lifestyle of this world is telling us that he's coming. The Bible says flee fornication. And so we need to put off the works of darkness. And the Bible says not in sensual, not in chambering. And then folks, I see another word in this verse. It says, uh, and wantonness. You know what wantonness means? It means no shame, shamelessness. Today there's no sense of shame. It's amazing that we have lost our blush. The only animal that has uh, capabilities of blushing, someone said that studies all these animals, is the only one that can blush is humans. And we're the only one that needs to blush. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 3 verse 9. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 9. This is where we are in America. This is where we are in these last days. And folks, Jesus is coming soon, and, Jesus, and boy is He hot. And there's going to be judgment with His coming. Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, The show of their countenance doth witness against them. In other words, when you sin, uh, people, you know, there are some people that are habitual liars. You know, I called some people this week lying. I, just, I, I tell you what, you can't deal, you can't help a liar. I mean, if you're going to be dishonest, don't waste my time trying to help you. You get right with God and get honest and stop playing the role and stop trying to impress people with your little stories. But I want to tell you something, friend. The Bible says this. It says that uh, in uh, verse 9, 
the show of their countenance does witness against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom, and they hid it not. Woe unto their souls, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. And the Bible says in Jeremiah that they have lost their blush. Folks, sin doesn't bother you anymore. We're getting used to the darkness. So there's a, there's a sensual uh, sins in the last days that's causing people to be apathetic and indifferent and worldly and, and sensual and then shameless. And then the Bible says this, and I want you to turn to it, and I think this uh, is in verse 13. It says, in wantonness, wantonness. That's sh- not, that has no shame. But then look, look at the next verse, the word. It says, not in strife. Not in strife. You know, the average church can't get along. Uh, the day somebody called me, since I'm the moderator of the tri-state, and said, please pray for a pastor in our church. There's a devil in his church and is literally tormenting him. And just, it just causing all kinds of, of stress. So I text him, and he forgot who I was. And he said, I'm sorry, Brother Wayne. Uh, I, 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 this is working on my brain. I'm losing my mind. And I'm so sorry that I didn't recognize who he was. I said, don't worry about me. I just want to let you know we're praying for him. I want you to pray for this pastor. I'm going to tell you something. Devil, the devil plants people in the, uh, the assembly. The devil plants people lying spirits and, 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 and gossiping and dissension. I mean, plants them in good churches like this. And tries to get to the preacher and tries to get him upset. Won't look at him when he tries to shake your hand. I mean, just, you know, knowing that full well that through the week you probably gossiped and said everything in the world. But I want to tell you something, friend. That's when we ought to wake up and realize we're not against each other. And we're not fighting each other. We're not here to hurt each other. We're not here to have political parties and try to promote ourselves and get jealous because somebody else has serving God and volunteered to do a little more than you have. Friend, we need to realize in the last days, churches are going to split, splatter, and splint. But I want to tell you, in the last days, families are going to divide. And that's the most unnatural affection when mom and daddy can't get it together and the children have to have visitation hours and there's a terrible uh, plight called divorce that's come upon this nation. And I want to tell you something, it'll hurt a child more than death. Some of y'all been through it. Some of y'all are child of that. And folks, there's child molestation all over this world. I have little sympathy for anybody like that. And, but, but I want to pray for them. I want to reach them. There, there's, uh, there's people praying on little children and babies, and it's ungodly what we're, what we're having here. And folks, it says that there's strife, and then there's envy. Nobody seems content anymore. They always want to get ahead. They always want to go so much in debt, they can't even have time at home because they're so far in debt trying to stay up with the Joneses. And folks, I want to tell you something. In the last days, this is the spirit. This is the materialistic, humanistic spirit of the world. And I just, I, I think y'all can all say amen. It's here. And we're the greatest nation on this earth. And I, and I love America, but I want to tell you something. America has went down uh, uh, into shame. We, we, we are trying to have legislation and, and, and the tax money is being cut off from North Carolina as we speak because they won't have same-sex bathrooms or allow some guy that's warped emotionally and maybe even demotic that wants to go in the girl's bathroom because he thinks he's a girl. Let me tell you something. I don't care what you think you are. Check your birth certificate and stay out of the ladies' bathroom. God help us. And folks, that's in the news headlines today. I mean, Kennedy tried to put uh, put a man on the moon and now Obama's trying to put a man in the bathroom. A ladies' bathroom. That's sad. You say, you shouldn't say anything against our president. Hey, listen, I'm going to say what's, what I want to against somebody that's so ungodly. I'm praying for him. I try to respect him. But I want to tell you something, friend. That tells us we're in the last days. And don't you point a finger at the president if your family's not what it ought to be, if you're not what you ought to be. And I want to tell you something. Children are growing up uh, disillusioned. They're growing up uh, uh, on drugs, 
and liquor and, 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 and pushing things they shouldn't push and dying prematurely. And folks, we're in a mess. M-E-S-S. -S. I mean, that's a South Georgia word for there's no word to describe how bad it is. And this is the last days. And I want to just close with this. It's high time. It's high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. There's the warring. And let us put on the armor, put on the armor of, of light. The armor of light. And then I want to close with a positive note. And I said, I wish you would. We not only need to wake up, we not only need to clean up, we need to dress up. Look at verse 14. And it says, But put, on, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What's that mean? Put on. We don't want no put-ons. What's put on the Lord Jesus Christ? And make not provision of the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Well, folks, we cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. When we put on Christ, we yield to Him. We yield to the new man, not the old man. The Spirit of God has free rule and reign in our life. And the Lord becomes the master for our direction. The Lord becomes the master for our direction. Look at the Word. It says, and put on the Lord. There's not much lordship around America today. No, he, He's rationed out as emergency rations. And we call on God when 911 takes place. And, and He's an emergency. But folks, listen. The Lord is the master for our direction. He ought to guide us and lead us. And folks, it takes one thing. We need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, not to put on a front and make no provision for the flesh. What's that saying? That's saying, friend, we need to die to self and let Him be Lord. Let Him be Lord. See, they use the full title of Jesus. Lord means master. And you're His servant. You're His servant. Tells you what to do, where to go, and when to come. You ought to, you ought to be His servant. You ought, to, you ought to let Him be his, your master. And then He, deliver, he, he directs you. And, he, he, and you're dedicated to Him. And everything about your life is this. Lord, it's, not, it's you. It's all you. You're Lord of my life. You're Lord of every minute. You're Lord of every day. What we need in these last days is people that will crown Him Lord. Because we're in a crowd that's full of darkness and sin and perversion and wickedness and apathy and a lukewarm church and, and people are not preaching the Bible anymore. The average church preaches some perversion. And they, and they, and they have... God, the world's music coming into the church and that's the only way they can get a crowd. It's the only way they can grow. And so we need the Lord to be our master. And then number two, it says Jesus. Lord Jesus. He's going to be, he needs to be our Savior. And the Bible says our salvation is closer than it's ever been. And folks, that means salvation from the presence of sin. Hey, we're about to get out of here. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. Look up, my children. Redemption draweth nigh. How many believe that? I really believe that this could be the last week of our life on this earth. I believe the trumpet could sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive may, shall be caught up to be with the Lord. In a twinkling of an eye. In a, a twinkling of an eye. And so he's going to, he, we need to realize the Savior for deliverance dresses us up, up in righteousness as long and, and not only is He Lord, but He's Savior. And He's going to save us from this. And then last but not least, I see the word Christ. Folks, He's, he's the King for, for dominion. And folks, I want to tell you this. He is the one who rules over us and overrules all this junk going on. And we need to wear Jesus as the armor of light. It's dark out there. I can't believe this little old town, this little old road, they can't keep it open. It's been closed for three days trying to fix one leak in the road. And I, and I fussed because I had to go two miles out of the way, and some of y'all travel faithfully from Eton, Georgia. And I thank God for you. 
And some of you travel a long ways to this church. I appreciate it. West side. A lot of you come from the west side. And Ringo. I appreciate every mile you drive. But I want to tell you something, friend. The reason is, he's king. He's Lord. He's the Messiah. He's the one that's ruling. And folks, he ought to be the armor of light. And folks, as in the Old Testament days, when they substituted the gold for brass, there was no reflection and the battle was lost. We need to be real gold. We need to be real for God. We need to realize that we need to reflect His light in a dark, dismal world. Drive down Doug Gap Road. It blows my mind. There's some kind of symbol up on top of that moss. And then there's this 8 foot, 9 foot uh, Buddha in the front yard up here. And then there's a church that worships Joseph Smith. And Brigham Young. And folks, we're, we're just a little town. We're just a little old country town. We're just a little old town. 23,000 in the city limits when I moved here. I don't know what it is now. Probably 22. But friend, listen. I'm telling you. We need to realize that we need to reflect His light in a dark and dismal world. And folks, we don't manufacture the light. We just reflect it. And so we need to be at the right angle. We need to, how do you do that? Well, you throw away the old clothes. Look at this, look at this last part of the verse. And make not provision for the flesh. I want to tell you something. If you're an alcoholic, get rid of the beer in your refrigerator. If you have trouble with pornography, stop looking at it. Find somebody to get some covenant eyes on your computer and just stop it. Stop it. Cease from doing it. But if you hang around those that do, hey, you got problems with smoking? Don't go to a smoke-filled room. Don't leave some in the glove compartment. That's making provision for the flesh. If you got a weakness with women, stop going there. Stop looking. And dress where they won't look at you so much, ladies. You want to conquer the illicit relationship, flee the person that you feel the lust towards. Because that flesh will cost you your family. If you want to stop smoking, don't go around it. Tear it to pieces and flush it! Say amen. That's the way you do it. Never forget one time in a storefront, this guy uh, came down the altar and he wanted to give a testimony and he folded his arms and two packs of Winston's came out of his two front pockets. He had two front pockets. And I said, well, praise God, that's a good place for them, amen. <laughs> I mean, that's suicide on the installment plan if you hadn't checked lately. It'll kill you, amen. I can't even go in a room without choking up. Sinus problems, nothing. Praise God, you won't have no sinuses after that stuff gets finished with you. And then drinking. Hey, get the wine coolers out of the cabin. Hey, get the beer out of the back seat. Stop going to these fancy restaurants and drinking your little wine saying it's okay. One-tenth drunks drunk. Make no provision for the flesh. And I want to tell you something. If you're an alcoholic, it only takes one drop, one turn of the faucet, and it's over. And you know it. So this is great, great verse. It just said, just don't make no provision for it. If you don't want to get burned, stay away from the fire. That's deep. I know y'all drove 30 miles to hear that one. Hours late. Flee sin. If you, it, it, listen, you say, well, I'm going to get as close as I can to sin so I can be a witness. No, I'm going to tell you what, you're going to be a casualty. Because the Bible says, make no provision for the flesh. Well, I, I think it's all right to go to the concert and listen to songs about adultery and wickedness and divorce. No, it's not. It's not. Just go ahead, go ahead and sit there and pay you $45, $50 for your little concert. And I want to tell you something. Your kids will take it to excess. They'll take it to excess. Because they'll, they'll justify that mom and daddy go to those concerts. Why can't I listen to that stuff? And why can't I hang around 
uh, you know, some guy that's cool, hand loop, sinner, calloused, indifferent, never comes to church, wouldn't come to church if you paid him. But boy, you're going to lift him up as a hero. Make no provision for the flesh. Now, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say it real quickly. You've got to start early. Because if you try that with a teenager, they'll buck like a wild horse. Say amen. Matter of fact, they might just walk off and never come back. But boy, I want to tell you something. You get about two years old, they know where they got to eat. Come on, say amen. They know where they got to sleep. And they know mama loves them, and they'd rather have mama's discipline than anything else. And daddy's. You got to start early. Make no provision for the flesh. How many times has people said, well, I was going to give it up, but that sin struck me like a snake. A fellow one time brought a whole box of rattlesnakes home, and he thought he was great because he could catch these rattlesnakes down in Claxton, Georgia, the rattlesnake roundup. We used to take our youth. We didn't take them to McDonald's. We took them to the rattlesnake roundup, and we just looked at all these rattlesnakes. Amen. Boy, I mean, we really had problems. We ate fruitcake and watched rattlesnakes in Claxton, Georgia. What a wonderful time. But you could have a youth activity and they'd all come because they didn't have anything else to do. It was great. Our big activity was going to Statesboro to go to McDonald's because our little town didn't have a McDonald's. And we'd go soul winning and take a whole town like Metter, Georgia and take the whole town and, and, and cover it with track before we'd go to McDonald's and have 60 youth riding on an old bus 23 miles to go to McDonald's. But this fellow brought his rattlesnakes home and his little toddler came out on the front porch. Didn't know what was in that box. They got busy in the back of the house, and she opened up that box. And about two rattlesnakes got her at the same time. A little toddler. She died. And Daddy, you could hear Daddy screaming night after night, Why did I bring them home? Why did I bring them home? Why did I bring them home? And I'm going to tell you this, friend. If you make provisions for the flesh, you're bringing sin to your home. And it will conquer you. It'll, it'll, it'll consume you. So life's too short. Eternity's too long. And the gospel's too wonderful for us to sleep through it all. It's high time we wake up. Next week is not vacation Bible school just to have it on the first week of June. It's a rescue mission. It's the gospel given to these young people. It might be their future it might be their marriage. It might be their children's children that they'll reach through this one week. But folks, if we don't have an urgency about it, we'll stroll in here about 10 minutes late saying, you know something, I wish I hadn't volunteered. I'm tired. Well, be tired for a week because it'll be worth it because we're in the last days. And Jesus is coming. And deathbeds are coming. And we need to get busy for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, Thank you so much for your word. And thank you for this great verse on make no provision for the flesh. But Lord, before the make no provision of the flesh, it says put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you're our master, you're our savior, you're our king, you're our Messiah. And God, may we crown you Lord of everything and every part of our life that we might not make provision of the flesh because Lord, we cannot cast off the works of darkness we can't even identify them without you, the light of the world, making sin very dark.